My name is Olivia and I'm a third semester <laughs> in the worship ministry major. And I am so excited and so honored to be here with you today to share something that I truly believe is an encouragement and a reminder to all of us this morning. I wanna start out with a question. How many of us know that this season of Highlands College is a preparation season, right? We're here to be equipped, we're here to be trained, we're here to gain the tools that we need to step into the assignment that God has for us. And if we're honest, there's sometimes in this journey of Highlands College that we can become so focused on the preparations for the next season that we miss what God is doing right here and right now. And this leads me to a passage in scripture in Luke chapter 10. This is a story that most of us are familiar with. Jesus is coming to visit his friends, Mary and Martha. And it says in verse 39, Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. And I think that we can be like Mary. We can recognize that God is in the room and choose to sit at his feet and to sit in his presence. But if we're honest, there's a lot of times where we're just like Martha. I think that Martha was so distracted with the preparations of what was coming next. She was getting the house ready for Jesus to come over that she missed the fact that Jesus himself was in the room with her. And I think I love Jesus's response to her. He simply tells Martha that Mary has chosen the one thing that is needed. And I think that Jesus is saying that to us this morning, that sitting in his presence at his feet is greater and it is better than any service we can ever give to our God. It is the best thing, the best thing. And in this busy season of Highlands College, his presence has to come first. In the morning when we wake up, spending time with him has to come first. Before we have that conversation with that student, he has to come first. So HC, it is time that we put our focus back on the best thing, the one thing that is needed and not become distracted by the preparation of the next thing. Let this not be just another chapel. No, our God is in the room today and it's his presence that changes us, his presence that prepares us, his presence that frees us and our God wants to meet with us this morning. So as we go back into a time of worship, I encourage us, find your space in this room. Let's fix our eyes on the one thing that is needed. Don't let this moment just go by without experiencing the presence of God because it is the best thing, the one thing that is needed. So can we lift our holy hands? God, we are so thankful for you. We are so thankful that you sent your son, your one and only son, so that we could experience your presence, God, so that we could sit in your holy presence. We thank you that you chose to dwell in your people, God. We are here to worship you. We fix our eyes on you this morning.
You did not 
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who had come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Go ahead and say hey to a couple people around you, and you can go ahead and take your seat. What's up, HC? Oh, y'all can do better than that. Who's excited to be in chapel today? I love you guys so much. I just love being in this room. I love sensing God's presence. I know this is like asked a lot of times from a platform, but I think it's an encouraging question to ask to remind ourselves and to hear each other as we just reflect on this is the place that God has called us. And how many of you guys are in this place and in love with Jesus today? Anybody love Jesus? It's so much, so much fun. And uh, how great did Olivia do on, on, oh my, this is awesome. I don't know where she is. And I am so jealous of anyone who can preach like that and then sing. It is not fair. Pastor Lane and I both have the same, the same situation. If we ever sing, though, everybody's going to leave the room instantly. And so uh, great job, Olivia. And hey, I just wanted to, for a moment, um, I was actually out of town last week. I, st I started school again, everybody. So y'all can pray for me. I'm in, hey, I feel your pain. I'm getting ready to write papers and all that. I'm uh, working on my doctorate. It's going to be crazy. Chris Hanna is going to give me all the answers to all the tests. I, I don't know. That's, that's probably sin. But anyway, so, um, so I missed you guys last week. So I'm excited to be here this week. And I uh, just want to tell you this. So, and this is church life. Uh, this is some out in the community, even in my own neighborhood. I have heard more than I have ever heard in the last 11 years of Highlands College. People come up to me and say things like, oh my goodness, this class of HC, like all the students at HC right now, this person at Highlands College did this. People who employ some of you are saying, hey, this is the best employee I've ever had. I know it's kind of weird to clap for yourself, but can we just celebrate yeah. the, the, what the um, incredible amount 
of just godly talent and passion and who you are is already making an eternal impact. I wanna say that again, who you are. You don't wait to do ministry one day. You're doing it now in our church, in communities, in businesses. And I'm just telling you, I am so proud of you. I'm, I'm proud to be any part of this. Uh, and it's amazing. You know, Highlands College is not a place. It's a people. It's the people in this room. It's, it's the impact you're making. It's why we do all of this. And so uh, just love you guys a ton and love that we're here today. Got a lot coming up. So I want to honor a few people. I have an incredible friend in the room today, Pastor Rod Plummer and, Masa- and Pastor Masashi from Lifehouse Tokyo. We love you. We love you, love you, love you. And uh, many of you guys know Pastor Rod. Have any of y'all in this room been on a trip to Tokyo? Any of you, any of you guys? Some, some of y'all, I know some of y'all, many other HC students have. Uh, I went, I don't know what year that was, 2016, 17 maybe. I um, have been back several times, but my first trip there with Pastor Lane was just massive. It made a massive impact in my life. And just what God's doing in our church uh, is incredible. He's a dear friend and, and really a, a partner in the gospel. And we love sowing into his church and what God's doing. And so he's going to be around all week. And I think there's different connections. Stephen, is that right? With Pastor Rod, if God's, if you've ever felt a call just to take what God's doing in your heart here, the ministry you're training for, uh, and then to translate that internationally, this is a great week for you to lean into that and to see what see what's up there. And so it's awesome to have him there. And we also have some some guests here. I know we had Discovery Day last week. But we have uh, three young ladies who actually travel with our guest speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment, who are here today kind of on a personal visit hanging out. And they're right, they're right over here. So it's, I'll make sure I get this right. It's Katie, Faith, and Rosalie. Is that right? Can y'all wave at us? Can y'all wave at us over there? So can y'all honor them? And so... So, so glad to have you girls here with us. And uh, they actually travel with our pastor who's gonna be speaking today, uh, just kind of hanging out. I think their parents are here as well, which is, which is amazing. And so they're checking out HC. And y'all, I just, I asked the team just for their, their, their resume. I'm like, who, I'm like, who are these girls? Like, just tell me a little bit about these girls. And so they were just sharing how they're involved in their church. They're leading small groups. They're leading um, at, through FCA on their campuses. How God just has a huge just gift and anointing on all three of these young ladies' lives. And don't y'all love people like, and I mean, that's who y'all are. Don't y'all love having people like that thinking about Highlands College? So then, then I asked a few more questions and I'm like, well, tell me more about, have they applied? Yeah, they've, they've applied. Well, are they qualified? Come on, right? Like, like they got, I mean, for academically and in leadership, and all those areas. I'm like, like, absolutely. And in fact, the team was like, they, they qualify at the highest marks of all. And we're even thinking about, you know, investing in these girls a scholarship. And I'm like, really, let's talk more about that. And kind of processing with the team, found out they were going to, in a few weeks, get an email with some next steps and all of that. And I thought, why don't we just get rid of all of that? And since they're here today, I'm excited to actually award them a scholarship right now, all three of them, an exceptional student scholarship. And yeah, come on up. Y'all come on up. If your parents are here, y'all come on up. While you're at Highlands College, let's just do this. And Pastor Michael has, has the actual scholarship itself. It's a $15,000 a year scholarship to Highlands College. It's, it's our honor to award that to you while, you're, while your whole team is here. And so let's get, let's get a picture. Y'all give it up for them. It's awesome. And, uh, and we obviously want you to continue to pray and ask God where you're supposed to be. But uh, hopefully that may be an answer, an answer, an answer to, to some of that, some of that, those exact prayers. Well, I'm excited to bring Pastor Ashley Woolders up right now, who is just truly having him here is just like pinch myself. I have so much respect from him, which has been mostly from a distance and through some of his dear friends like Pastor Lane, who's a, a close friend of his. Um, he took over leading the church, CCV, Christ Church of the Valley in the Phoenix area, I think in 2017. And God has just used him in incredible ways, building what, on what was already a strong legacy and just taking it into the next season, which is a rare gift, by the way, in, in the church world and should be celebrated when God does that in and through someone. They have 16 campuses in that entire area. They're reaching thousands of people every single week with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, and by the way, in a very important area of our country, an area of influence uh, where we believe God has some great things in store from and through just in the creative space, innovation, business, so much happening in the Phoenix area. 
that it's no surprise God would build a great commission church right there in the heart of that, of that community. He's full of innovation and creativity and just what I love focuses a ton on culture, which is so important. Come on, Highlands College, stand to your feet and honor Pastor Ashley as he comes to preach God's word. Wow. Hey, let's give it up for God one more time. Yeah, all that God's doing in your, your college. Man, I just, if I did nothing else this week other than just worship, and Olivia, like just to sit in the presence of God today, that's what we need to do. Amen. Let's give it up for God one more time. Thank you. I, I also, just for a minute, I, I just want to honor your leadership, you know, PC and Mark, who I've got to know a little bit, and Lane. I don't know of a church that is leading more generously to everyone, but especially investing in your generation. And we just need to honor what God's doing at HC. Like, and through your, and your leaders are leading, so let's give it up for them. Thank them. Thank you, God. Love you guys, man. Great job. You can, uh, you, you can have a seat. When I look back on my life, the most painful and frustrating seasons that I've ever been through is when God puts me in a season where I have to have to wait. Anybody? Is that awkward? Hey, what, what about when, you, when you're in a deep season of waiting? Any, anybody, anybody else love to wait? Like in one hand, right? you love to aim, praise the Lord. Here, we got one that loves to wait. For the rest of us, including me, it's, it's like my Achilles heel, okay? I hate waiting. And everything I'm going to teach you today comes out of a place of deep pain in my life. But I thought we'd start with maybe just a survey of how much you hate waiting, all right? And so I'm going to give you seven questions today, seven questions. They're just true or false, and I want you to just count how many you say true to, and I might do a little little survey at the end. You ready? Question number one. When checking out, I always, always look for the shortest line. Amen? Anybody there? Some of you are like, duh. Why would you not? I did a little research on this. Did you know that the average person spends three years of their life waiting in a line? It's true. It's really true. But that's question number one. Here's question number two. A yellow light doesn't mean slow down. It means speed up and get through it. Huh? Come on. Has, has anyone here ridden in a car with Lane Schrantz? A red light, a red light means go to him, man. I don't even know, you know. Okay, here, here's just a little, little, little more facts, all right. This is kind of crazy. The average person will spend six months of their life waiting at a red light. That's how much you'll spend. All right, that's question number two. Here's question number three. I rarely go to the doctor because I hate waiting in the waiting room, right? Anybody there? True or false for you? Question four. This is deep, okay? You got to be honest on this one. I have cut through a gas station lot to avoid a red light. <laughs> Anybody there? Dude. So I was, I've done this before. I was actually attending traffic school, um, not for this, but because I was speeding, because I, I, I'm impatient, all right? So I was sitting through traffic school, and the traffic instructor said this. He said, You're not allowed to cut through a gas station parking lot to avoid a red light. That will give you a ticket. But the law, at least in Phoenix and in Arizona, the law is your feet have to touch the ground in the gas station parking lot for it to be legal. So he said what you could do, and I'm not saying you should do this, okay, I'm not not suggesting this. He said what you could do is when you're pulling through the gas station parking lot, open your door, just step on the ground, and then just keep going, okay? Legal. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, but have you ever done that? That's question four. Here's question five. I don't care what food tastes like. I just need it now. It just needs to be fast, okay? True or false? Question number six. 
You keeping track? You know where you're at? Question six. People who talk really slow annoy me to death. And you're slow talkers, you're like, just speed it up. You know? Here's the last question. I'm timing this sermon to track how much time you have left. Anybody out there? Okay, that's seven questions. How many of you would be uh, like six out of seven? Anybody seven out of seven? Okay. Anybody zero? It, you know, it's one thing to wait through the normal seasons of life, but what about when you're waiting on God? What about when God has spoken something into your life and you know he wants it for you, you know it's true, he may have even called you to something, and you're waiting on God? Again, everything I'm going to teach you today comes out of pain and what God's taught me through the painful seasons of waiting, but I've just been praying this whole entire week for you. And here's my hunch. And the reason I chose this topic, my hunch is that God has some of you right now in a deep season of waiting. And I don't even know what it is, but as I was praying for you, I'm just going to throw a few things out that came to my mind as I was praying with God for you. Some of you are in waiting for healing. And it could even be something physical. And you've seen doctors, and you've tried to get answers, and you don't have answers, and so you're stuck waiting. Some of you, it's not physical, it's actually mental. You've got some mental health stuff going on with anxiety or depression, and what you've done is you've called out to God. You've asked him to move in an area where, God, please remove, please help me deal with, please help me deal with this stuff in my mind that I don't want to deal with, and you're still waiting because it's still there. Some of you are waiting, this, this, some of you are waiting on a parent. And you've been disappointed by a parent. You've been hurt deeply by a parent. And you're waiting for them to get their act together or at least just say, I'm sorry. And you're still waiting. Hey, some of you are waiting on just that one special person, right? Actually, forget that. You're waiting on one good date. Just one. And you know what? You're saying, you're like, I'm not even picky anymore. Like I used to be picky. I used to have a list of 40 things that I was required for someone that could date me. And you're like, forget that. The list is down to three. You're like, he just has to be a Christian, take a shower, and maybe want to have a job. Not even have a job, but want to have a job, right? That's all you want, just like one good date. Some of you, this just came to my mind, so I'm just going to say it. Some of you are waiting on a car. Like, you don't want a BMW, you just want a beater. Just something, right? You're like, God, just provide some transportation. Like, I'm bumming rides off everybody. Some of you, here, here's the deepest one. Some of you feel called to something. Like, you literally feel like a calling of God on your life. And nothing's happening. Nothing. Nothing. There's no opportunities. There's no prospects. You don't even see a way forward into the calling of what you sense on your life. Your theme for this week, which, I, which this month, which I love in HC, comes from John 10.10. 10. This is your theme for the week, right? So John 10.10. 10. Let's, let's read this together. I have come that they may have what? Life. And have it to the, Jesus came so that you could have the fullest life possible. And what you've been learning this month, I, I think, is that, that the full life in Jesus is not always match up with what the world tells you a full life is. Amen? But here's a question I want to answer today. And it's very, very simple. This is the overarching question I want to answer today. Should a full life in Jesus be full of waiting? Let me say it again. Should a full life in Jesus, the fullest life that Jesus wants for you, should it be full 
of seasons of painful waiting. And I want us to answer, not from our gut today, because that's what we so often do. No, at HC, what do we do? We answer from God's word, right? We allow God to speak into our questions, not this world or our intuition. So I want to just open scripture today. And again, God's taught me so much because the most painful season of, of my life is when I was around 25, God called me to something. It was so clear, like crystal clear. My wife confirmed it. Friends confirmed it. I heard it like specifically from God. And God put me in a painful season of waiting. I mean, desperate season of waiting. And God didn't make me wait a week. He didn't make me wait a, wait, wait a month or a couple months. He didn't even make me wait a year. God made me wait almost four years. And it was during these four years that with so much frustration at God, so much fasting, so much prayer, that I began to seek scripture on the topic of waiting. So what I want to do today is I just want to give you three principles for sure, and if we still have time, I'm going to slip in a fourth, okay? You ready to roll? I hope you're taking notes today. When we look at this biblically, here's principle number one. If God's making you wait, you're in good company. Does that make you feel good? Yeah. No, it probably doesn't, actually. You're like, oh, I'm in good company? Well, I'm still waiting. But I really think you need to look at this biblically and say, here's what happens when you open the pages of Scripture on this topic. I can't find in Scripture one hero of the faith that God used miraculously that God didn't also put in a deep, painful season of waiting. Can I give you a few examples? Joseph, who God is going to use in miraculous ways, goes into a pit, Potiphar's house, and a prison, and he has to wait 13 years before God promotes him. 13 years. Let me give you another example. How about Paul? See, when we think about the Apostle Paul, we all know the road to Damascus. We know the light shone, shone down and God called him and let's go. He's going to do missionary journeys and change the world. Did you know from when that light shone down on Paul on the Damascus road to when Paul took his first missionary journey? Do you know it was 14 years? 14 years Paul waited. David is probably my favorite example because let's just talk about the story of David for a moment. Samuel, the prophet Samuel, shows up at David's house. David's dad doesn't even think he's worthy, so he leaves him in the field. And finally, Samuel says, you got one more? And he's like, well, I got this shepherd boy, but he's nothing. Brings him in. Samuel anoints David king. Does it get any more clear than that? You are anointed in the presence of your dad and the prophet and your brothers to be king. Do you want to know how long David waits from his anointing to when he is actually placed as king of Israel? 15 years. He is a case study on waiting. And by the way, David's waiting was really, really painful. We'll read some of his words later. How about Abraham and Sarah? God says, I am going to create a new nation through you, Abraham. Well, a new nation requires a child, God. Right. Right. You know how long Abraham and Sarah waited from the promise to when they had a child? 25 years. 25 years. The one that scares me the most in Scripture is the one I'm going to give you next. It's Moses. God calls Moses to deliver the people out of bondage, and he sticks them in a desert for 40 years. Does that scare anybody else? Anybody else want to wait for 40 years? Okay, who do we follow? Who do we follow? Jesus. Jesus is born the Son of God. And when does he start his public ministry? 30 years later. You could go on and on and on. If you're in a season of waiting, here's what I want to tell you. You're in good company. But when you look at people that waited, here's what you don't see, probably outside of Jesus, you just don't see people in seasons of waiting going like this. Thank you, Lord, for making me wait. 
You don't see it. In fact, what you see over and over again is you see people crying out to God in pain in their waiting seasons. David says this in Psalm 13, how long, Lord? Like, will you forget me forever? David thought that God had forgot his promise and his anointing. You, you've forgotten me. He says this, how long will you hide your face from me? And by the way, we have permission in Scripture to cry out to God in seasons of waiting. And it's okay to question God. It's okay to cry out to God. But when you read the Psalms, when David cries out to God and he questions God, what does he do almost at the, at the end of every single Psalm in which he questions God? He moves back to his grounding. He moves back to who God is. He says this in Psalm 13 but I trust your unfailing love. God, I question you, but I trust you at the exact same time. Here's a second thing, a second principle I think we see from Scripture when it comes to waiting. While you're waiting, God's still working. While you're waiting, God's not just working. My opinion, he's doing his greatest work in your life. Hey, being in college is kind of a season of waiting, isn't it? In fact, someone said it earlier. I, I love what they said. They said, hey, we're, we're here being prepared. You may put it this way. While you're waiting, God is preparing. That's exactly what he's doing. And what would God be preparing us for? Can I give you a few things? I'll just give you three. Three things I think God is doing as, as he's preparing as you're waiting. Number one, God may be working on your competency so you're prepared for what's next. The most unloving thing God could ever do for you in your life is to put you in a position that you're not qualified to actually perform. The issue is we often see ourselves as way more qualified, don't we? We have pride inside of us. and We're like, well, I'm ready now. And God's like, you're not even close. And I'm going to put you in seasons of preparation that are going to develop your competency. I remember being a young, young child, and um, I just always thought I was more ready than I was. You know, when you're little, you're just like, I, I want to I I go, you know. Um, my dad and I would go shoot guns sometimes, and uh, I had a BB gun, which is like lame. My dad had the 12 gauge, and I would watch this gun go off, and I so desperately wanted to shoot that 12 gauge, and I would just beg him, Dad, I mean, I was five years old, I'd be like, Dad, let me shoot the 12 gauge, and he's like, you're not ready, you're not ready, and I'd be like, I'm ready, Dad, I'm ready, Dad, and finally one day, I don't know what snapped him, he's like, go ahead then, and so I put my little BB gun down, and a five-year-old, I grab, I grab this 12 gauge shotgun, have you ever seen those videos where someone just flies backwards, like, you know, 12 feet, I pulled the trigger on this gun and I don't remember what happened next, man. I was like back there. I felt like my shoulder came off. And I think my dad looked at me and he's like, do you understand now? And oftentimes in our lives, we're like, God, I'm ready. And he's trying to tell us, let me develop your competency. God, I'm ready for a leadership position right now. He's like, if I put you in that position, you would fail. God, I want a man. I want a man. Please. And God may be looking at you saying, but you're still acting like a little girl. Okay? Now, some of you guys are like, God, bring me a hottie. Come on, bring me somebody. And God's like, you're still a little boy. Do you, do you understand that, it, that if, if, if you're not prepared spiritually, emotionally, that the dream person that you want God to bring along, if he brought them right now, they may not even be interested in you? What's God doing when he's waiting? When we're waiting, he's preparing you. As one person said, he's preparing you to become the person you're looking for is actually looking for. Don't discount what God's doing while you're waiting, here's the second thing I think God's doing. He's working on, our, on our, your character so you don't fail at what's next. He may be working on your competency, but he's also working on your character. 
I love leadership. That's why I love hanging out with, with your staff because they're students of leadership. As I've studied leadership, here's one of my big takeaways with leadership. Um, I used to always think character is what makes a leader. It doesn't. Now hang with me. How many of you know someone with deep, deep, deep character who can't lead squat? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that have deep character, but they can't lead. So character doesn't make you a leader. Lean in. It sustains you as a leader. That's what character does. And so what God does is he often puts us in seasons where he goes, hey, for the leadership I want for you, I have to develop your character because if I put you in a position of leadership, your competency is going to take you to a place where your character can't sustain you. Do I need to give you examples from the church world of crazy, competent pastors whose character did not sustain where they were going? And by the way, praise God that you have a pastor at Highlands Church for 40 years, PC. Like we should, for 40 years, his character has sustained him, and that is why God is moving in your church. We have to develop our character so God can do the same thing. I think Saul and David is a really good example of this. Saul Probably a pretty competent guy from what we can tell, but he's thrust into a leadership position where his character doesn't sustain him. David, on the other hand, God makes wait for 15 years in painful seasons. And I think one of the things God's doing in David's waiting is he's developing David's character. Remember when David walks in the cave and he could have killed Saul and his men tell him, kill Saul. And David says, I won't do something that's against God's word. And God was just developing his character so when David becomes king, even though he has a few mess-ups, he still sustains him with his character. And David's a man after God's own heart. That's why later on David would write this in Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. What is, God, what is David doing in his waiting? He, said, he goes on and says this, and in his word I put my hope. So while you're waiting, we are in God's word, letting God's word develop our heart and our character to sustain us. And remember, God doesn't want your talent to take you where your character can't keep you, okay? Here's the third thing I think that God may be working on, and this may be the biggest. God may be working on your dependence so you trust more in him and less on you. Could you imagine for a moment that everything you wanted in life and desire that you could have at the snap of a finger. Like if it happened that fast, when you wanted it, it happened. Can I tell you what would happen in your life? You would get to a place where you don't even need God. And if you haven't realized this yet, God's greatest desire in your life is that you begin depending more on him and less on yourself. And again, some of you are at your wit's end. You're like, but God, just bring them. And when it comes to, I mean, let's think. It's a lot of us are single in here. God, just bring that man. Bring that woman. I'm trying everything. I'm on every dating app. I've gone to all the hot spots in town because I'm single. I want to mingle. Like, I've just, I bought new clothes. Like, I'm working out. I'm showing more skin. I'm flirting with everything that has a heartbeat. God, what are you doing? You see what I'm saying? This is where we end up. And finally, some of us get to a place where we say this. I give up. I give up. Here's what I think God is saying in heaven. He's looking down at you going like this. Finally. I've been waiting for this forever because you keep relying on your competency and your control and you won't rely on my, your dependence on me to bring the right person. Have you ever noticed in dating that when someone is like, God, I'm going to stop trying. I just want to focus on you. That's when God brings somebody. Is that amazing? It's because it's God wants our dependence on him. And this is, this is a whole different message, but one of the things God's been teaching me is that when your competency is really low, your dependency is sky high. And what happens is as our competency grows, our dependency has a tendency to move in the opposite direction. And our, our goal in life is to say, 
fully dependent on God, no matter where our competency is, but God may have you in a season of waiting so that your dependency on him grows exponentially. I love what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Listen to Jesus' words. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. That should speak to somebody. You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope because with less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Isn't that beautiful? And remember this, when you get impatient with God, God is far more interested in who you're becoming than what you're doing. Stop focusing on like all the stuff you want to do and just be, become the man or woman of God that God wants for you. Hey, what, what's God doing when you're waiting? He may be working on your competency so you don't fail at what next. He may be working on your character so you, he can really sustain you long term in ministry. He could be working on your dependence. That season I told you about when I was uh, 25 years old, when I was 25, I I went to Bible college, and when I graduated Bible college, this is just my story. It's a little unique story. Um, I didn't go straight into ministry. I didn't, I didn't feel called. I actually went to work at a, a company called Intel and loved it and, and was thriving there. But when I was 25 years old, God gave me a specific call to go spend the rest of my life serving the local church. And I just assumed when God calls you, it happens immediately. So I was like, you better move, God. Open doors, open it up, I'm ready to roll. And again, I waited for four years. I thought something was wrong with me. I thought something was wrong with my prayer life. I thought maybe I wasn't hearing God correctly. And then I got to a place where I was like, God, I'm not even sure you even care. And when I look back now, those four years God did more in those four years to develop me than almost any other season in my life. Can I tell you a few things he did? God grew my competency. I grew more as a leader during those four years of waiting than I have at any season in my life. In fact, I, it would be impossible for me to do what I'm doing today as a senior pastor of our church in Phoenix if I didn't have those four years of waiting and I couldn't see it at the time. God was developing my character very transparently, I had some ingrained sin in my life. Things I was looking at that I knew were wrong. My, my thought life was off. And during those four years, God began to strip out and deal with some of that ingrained sin so that I could have the character that could sustain me long-term in ministry. And the other thing God began developing was just my dependence on him. I, I realized I wasn't all that dependent on God. I had a really, really good salary and Things were good, and during that season, God began to get our hearts really excited about generosity, and my wife and I began giving at a level that we had never given at before, and we got so dependent on God that now our dependence on him versus our reliance on ourselves, it just continues to elevate, and that's a beautiful position to be. I don't know where God's doing, what God's doing in your life during your season of waiting, but God's always working. Remember, a waiting season is never a wasted season. It is never wasted. And God often wants to do something in us before he does something through us. Here's, here's number three, if you're taking notes. God's delays are not always God's denials. Okay, when, when, when God's late or you, he has you in a season of waiting, we often assume that maybe the dream's dead. Maybe I heard God wrong. Maybe God doesn't want what I thought he may want for me. Now, God may want to change your mind, but oftentimes his delays aren't always his denials. And isn't Abraham and Sarah a good example of this? Again, they, God promised them a child. It's not happening, so what do they do? They take things into their own hands. Sarah has Abraham sleep with Hagar. She doesn't trust the promise. And by the way, that child became a thorn in their side for the rest of their life because when you circumvent God's waiting period, it always leads to destruction in your life. And finally, God tells Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child and listen to the response, Genesis 18. Sarah, she laughed in God's face. Sarah laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? 
Verse 13 says, then the Lord said to Abraham, hey, why'd Sarah laugh? And Sarah's like, I didn't laugh. He's like, yeah, you did, woman. And he says this in verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? What a good question. Later on in Hebrews, when when we read about the heroes of the faith, Hebrews chapter 6 says this about Abraham. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. That would be a good verse for you to memorize or put on a mirror or maybe a screenshot on your phone that when I wait patiently on God, he is faithful to deliver what he promised. I don't know where you're waiting, but God may not be denying what you want. He just may have you in a season of waiting. Uh, Last year, my daughter, oldest daughter graduated from Bible college and um, to celebrate, we took 28 of our family to Disneyland. And Disneyland is a hotbed of waiting, isn't it? We're going to spend 15 hours that day at Disneyland, which for me is like pain. So all 20 of us, we got there, and the first thing we did when we got to Disneyland is we ran to the new Star Wars ride. I don't know if you've been on the new Star Wars ride. You don't have Disneyland in Alabama, I know, but you can still travel, you know. But we, we went to this Disneyland or, or the Star Wars ride, and we walked up, it said 60-minute wait. And I was like, that's actually not bad for that ride. So we got in line, and we waited for 60 minutes in line. We were minutes from the front. I could see the ride. We were minutes from the front, and someone gets on the loudspeaker, <laughs> Uh, Excuse me, we've had a technical difficulty with the Star Wars ride. We're shutting it down, probably indefinitely, probably forever. It will never run again. You know, I don't know. That's that's what I heard. I was like, it's done. They they shut the ride down. They're like, we have no idea when it'll open back up. So we all got together, and I said, let's bolt. My wife and her sister, who's on the front row over here too, they said, hey, let's just wait it out. And I was like, no. So we waited. Because that's what you do as a godly man, okay? You listen to a godly spouse. Now, when we waited, uh, you, you have two postures you can have when you wait, right? You can endure it, ugh, or you can embrace it. And by the way, they said, hey, let's embrace this wait. So here's what my wife and... My sister-in-law did. They got together and said, Let, let's play a game. I was like, oh, this sounds stupid, but okay. So we played this game. You stick a, a water bottle in front of two people. And I don't know if you've ever played this before. You go head, shoulders, knees, toes, knees, shoulder. And then when someone says bottle, the first person that grabs the bottle, they win. And we were doing a big contest. Out of all 28 of us, who would be the champion? And I'm telling you, we were cracking up. We had 75 to 100 people, like, all crowded around us, cracking up, too. We had people taking side bets, I think. Who's going to win? You know, I mean, it was amazing. And we're all jacking. I mean, it was so fun. We waited two hours in line, and we finally got on that ride. And the whole rest of the day, we waited in lines, and we rode all the other rides at Disneyland. And the next morning, I texted everyone, and I said, I just want, and again, we wrote everything at Disneyland, all the fun stuff, all the food, everything we did. I texted everyone, and I said, what was your favorite memory at Disneyland? And you know what almost all of them said? When we waited in line. Do you understand that could be the story of your life? that the greatest season and memories you have would be a time of waiting where you didn't just endure the wait, you embraced the wait. And I want to just encourage someone here to embrace whatever waiting period you're in because if I could write a letter to my younger self, if I could write a letter to me, I would say this, Ashley, embrace the wait. God's doing his greatest work in your life. Now we got a couple minutes you, you, want, you want one last principle? I've never taught on this one, by the way, because you're special. I haven't. When I look at Scripture on this topic, here's one thing I notice, and it, it's this. The longer you wait, the bigger God's plans may be for you.
Can I give you an example? One of the shortest waits I see with one of the heroes of the faith is, is Nehemiah. And he's an, he's an amazing leader in Scripture. Nehemiah rebuilds the walls around Jerusalem. And for when God calls him to rebuild the walls to when it happens is about four months. It's no short amount of time, but I mean, four months is, is really nothing. I want to contrast that with, with Moses. Moses waits 40 years, right? It's one thing to rebuild a wall. It's another thing to deliver one million people out of a wall of slavery into the promised land. And we we just might think that, hey, the longer God's making you wait, the bigger plans he has for your life. And someone just thought, that means I'm going to marry a supermodel. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe God wants you to break a generational curse on your family. Maybe God wants you to be the person that there's no longer divorce or addiction. There's no longer that sin in your life. But hey, if you won't embrace the weight, how's God supposed to do the work? God may have someone here that's going to change an entire city. That's going to change an entire culture because of what God did in your waiting. So listen, I don't know where you're waiting. I just know this. God's working. And the question is, will you embrace the wait? Let's pray. Father, I pray over every student at Highlands College, the staff that's here, any other person that's here, God, someone here is in a deep, painful season of waiting. And they've questioned you. They've cried out to you. And Father, I just pray today that you would remind them that a waiting season isn't a wasted season. You still see them, and it's okay to cry out. But at the exact same time, we have to trust that you are moving while we're waiting. And will we embrace the wait so you can develop our competency, our character, and our dependence on you. And Father, would Highlands College be a place where followers of Jesus go out to change the world? We pray this now in Jesus' name. We all said, amen, amen. Oh, come on, can you all help me honor Pastor Ashley? in that incredible message today. Amazing. What a great message, right? If we're waiting, we're in good company. I love it, embrace the wait. And I know all of us, we've been in seasons of waiting. Maybe you're in that season right now. We're just gonna trust God with the process, amen. Awesome, well, a couple announcements. One more time, help me thank Pastor Ashley. Thanks for coming from CCV, for being here with us. We love it. Just send students here. We keep sending students there. It's just full circle. We'll just keep it going. But um, a couple announcements today. First of all, this Saturday, say Saturday. Saturday. We have game day, the HC Way. Come on, it's our tailgate happening at the rec from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You're all invited. If you can just RSVP so our team can prepare for you. We're going to have food. We're going to have games. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Watch some college football on a Saturday here in the South. There's no Saturday like it. So um, it's going to be fun. And then uh, this Thursday, we got Pastor Mayo from Live Atlanta here with us. Come on. It's going to be awesome. And then next Tuesday, we don't have chapel, but we do have donuts and doctrine at 1030 a.m. This is going to be happening in the rec with our academic team. How many of you all love our academic team? Make some noise. And then last but not least, we have a couple people with birthdays today in the room. Where's Josh Stoll? Raise your hand. Where's Josh? Come on. And Austin Booth. Raise your hand. Where's Austin? We love you guys. Have the best day, and we'll see you all on Thursday.